Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast presented by Zwift here with the Duas du Vlandre recap men and women's the men's as well too the women's actually dot pro race but in the men's edition we had Matthew van der Poel lining up at his first Belgian classic this year ahead of Sunday's Tour of Flanders we'll have the preview of that dropping tomorrow we recorded it before though so don't hold it against us there's a revised parkour here for Dwarves Dual Vlander, in which I've got to say, foot hand on heart again, I said to Benji, I'm not sure I want to cover this race, but they changed the parkour, 184 Ks, mm, more climbs in the middle like the Nochterberg, but it, it's it's light. It's not as savage as the Tour of Flanders. It really is intended, I think, to be a warm-up race. Peacock here with Turner. Uh, Campanats said he'd been targeting this, and Pagacha here as well to get his legs prepared for Sunday. But Benji, it went early. I saw on Twitter before when I was watching the end of the women's, <laughs> and VDP attacked at 90 k's to go, and it sort of didn't stop there. Yeah, I think he attacked indeed with 90 k's to go. He got caught again after that move, but it wasn't going to wait too much longer before we got the actual move that made a split in the peloton, and that was on the Berchtenhauter, the same climb on which uh, Van Bala got rid of his uh, contenders last year and went on the 52km solo on that same climb. In this edition, we had a move by Team Enios. We had both Ben Turner and Pitcock making a move. Pitcock was the one doing the real hammering on that climb, and it was intriguing because some People didn't have a good position. Pogaccio was not in a good position at that point in the race. He was uh, halfway to group and it cost him because even Benoit had a bad position, but his strength was there to move up during the Berchtenhau to climb, move up and be in a split that occurs with Ineos right there. And those Ineos riders were Pitcock and Turner, like I said. Benoit was closing that down. Van der Poel was closing that down as well. Stefan Kung was also there. Victor Kampenaerts, those were the men that were in that group and they were supposed to be catching the breakaway, including the likes of Nils Pollitt and O'Brien in that as well. And as I said, Pogaccio was not there, so he was not eager to uh, be happy about that. And he showed that because the gap went up to like 20 seconds. And on the next climb, we saw that both Pogacar and Peterson tried to follow that. And Peterson just completely imploded, by the way, like completely imploded on a climb. He just fell through the group completely. So he wasn't at all near that front group. And then Pogacar tried to do the ultimate bridge on the Kanadi bed. He attacked, dropped everybody, including the likes of Greg van Avermaet and so forth, and started going solo. But even though there were like 17 motorbikes between the two groups and the gap was like 25 seconds, those motorbikes started to disappear. And when they start disappearing, it's going to be harder to close down a 20 second gap. So he was kind of stuck between two groups with 15 seconds ahead of him, 15 seconds behind him, a complete chasse patate basically, because at that point you've got the situation where, yeah, if you can't close it, you're hanging in between and it wasn't looking good there. And do you think that this positioning weakness that he showed on the Berchten Haute could play into the Tour of Flanders this weekend? 100%. We said it on the preview. He doesn't. It's more difficult getting to the base of the Haling in a good position than the base of a climb in the Tour de France or in Lombardia or whatever. It's, yeah, it's, it's more difficult. And he doesn't have the team to do it either. Uh, he really doesn't. And... I don't think Trenton will or should probably be 100% dedicated to carrying Pagacha around all, all race on Sunday. So it is a problem for him. He needs to be basically trying to follow MVP on, on Sunday because I think following Wout is risky because Yumbo might play riders up the road. Anyway, speaking of MVP, you may have seen on Alps and Phoenix Aero socks, MVP's actually got Zwift socks. It's <laughs> actually rare to see uh, like... They're not the socks. They are the sock sponsor, but they're not the sock manufacturer. They're using the socks to advertise Swift on the jersey as well. Swift, also the title sponsor, of course, of the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast. If you missed any stages of the Tour of What's Hope here, or you want to do them all in one day, maybe something that sort of the vegan (laughs) cyclist would do, they're all available at the moment to fill in. I've got one I need to do of the Tour of Utopia uh, when I get back. But if you want to check out Zwift, if you haven't done any of the stages of the Tour of Utopia, you can do a seven-day free trial through Zwift.com 
through the link in the description down below. But that gap was gone. Pogacar eventually, I think, tried to break away from a group he was in with Madawaz, who didn't help him because Kuhn was ahead, and Jan Tratnik. I presume he told Tratnik he was about to do that. He did that on a cobble section. He looked very good, but it was only at 30 seconds. The group ahead was cooperating really well, generally speaking. A few surges from MVDP here, there, and there. Kel O'Brien skipping a lot of turns because he obviously, like, third here would be outrageously good. Uh, Niels Pollard also recovering a little bit. Ben Turner there, aka Clock for Pidcock. I didn't know. The thing is, Benji, MVDP's got the best sprint in the group, but MVDP never wants to wait for his sprint, which I think is why he wins so many races. Who was the set? It's kind of like everyone in the group. Like, I don't even think Pidcock wanted to go to the finish solo, and then Campanas, of course, doesn't. So. I'm surprised they cooperated so long. It was the whole strat with like 10Ks, 12Ks to go where Kung, this is what he does. Like he attacked in the front of MVP right at the end of this short climb, got brought back, and then that was a signal for chaos. Who was the next to go? I think it was, it was Campanats, right? Yes, yeah, so there's this little section with about... What is it? Seven-ish kilometers to go, eight-ish kilometers to go with a small descent. They already came across that with roughly 20 kilometers to go, that same descent. And he went already there at that point using arrow to his advantage, I'm guessing. Because like this man, Campanat, he's been prepping for this race for like ages. I think at the start of this year, he said that the one race he thinks he can win on cobbles is Duarte of Vlaanderen. And I'm not going to lie, kind of agree with him that that's the most fitting for him. And he made that move, like you said, on that small descent in the last section, the last seven, eight, nine kilometers somewhere. And he got a gap. He actually got a decent gap. And I was like, okay, nobody's responding that instantly. With Ineos, you could say, okay, they've got two riders. They can close this down. But I've got the feeling at that point in the race that Turner was already kind of done for. Everybody in the group was already kind of done for. And there was necessary action for Vanderpool to come in. And Vanderpool had to close down a bit as well there. And then Benoit started closing it down. And were you surprised that Benoit was closing it down knowing that Vanderpool's in that group? Or do you think he got desperate and thinking that Campanas would get away? Yeah, I was surprised he did, uh, to be honest. He did a pretty big effort to close it. And MVDP, I actually think, rode pretty smart. He was attacked a lot. He's going to be the guy looked at a lot. I think he does this. he did this thing where he... He does pull, keeping the gap at a reasonable level, but he, he then pulls for a while and he's like, flicks and sees if someone will help him. And then there were re-attacks afterwards and people, again, looking at him to close. And eventually Ben Turner couldn't help him. Or it was Pidcock or it was Campanas the second time or it was Campanas with uh, Teish Benoit. And he's then like, okay, these guys can't help me. And he tries to attack across. And it's like he's held back a little bit and he surges. I think Campanats attacked at least three times. There were so many attacks. If you, This is the best classic of the season so far, in my view. The last year was not great. I've made fun of this race a little bit. Whether it should be World Tour or not is a matter of debate, but this finale was incredibly exciting, and if you want to watch half an hour of exciting racing, go and watch it. But yeah, Campanats again. He went with Benoit. They were working together. I thought they were gone because – Benoit's like, eh, I'll take my chance against VC in a sprint. Kamenat's going to pull with Benoit. Benoit can't really sprint. But MVDP, I mean, he looks so strong, Benji. Yeah, certainly. And even before that, I think that the reason that they were not gone is that Kung was the one to jump like in between the two groups, in between those two up ahead and the group with Vanderpool. And was like, there was only a few meters between each of those with Kung in the middle. And I think Kung being there held it together. The glue that held it together in long enough for Vanderpool to then make that move to try and close it down again once they go into a, uh, was the horse racing, racing circuit that they venture into the, in, in the final two and a half-ish kilometers. And at that point, I was like, okay, what happens if Vanderpool closes it down? And we saw that Pitcock was the one that jumped towards that group past Vanderpool to those two riders and actually decided to make that move. As expected, someone would attack if the tempo goes down. So Pitcock was the one doing it. And directly Campanats on the wheel. Benoit on the wheel. And then we know there's there's probably a sprint coming at some point, you know? So who is going to make the move at that point? Well, yeah. I'm like, okay, it'll be a sprint now. Kel O'Brien, oh, he's decent. Like, lead out man, track guy. 
No, Benoit, just after Campanats attacked, re-attacked, and they were looking the other direction. MVDP had just closed down moves. Pidcock had just attacked, and this cost Pidcock here. He just didn't get that timing quite right. Benoit, I think, got a big moto draft as well, and MVDP sl slingshot across, and we knew it was done. As long as they kept pulling, this was a huge gap immediately and Campanats had shot all his shots. Benoit pulled with MVDP, pulled through initially. Did it make a difference? No. He's losing that sprint. Would I have pulled if I was Benoit? No. Agreed. Um, there's a 20% chance that maybe MVDP, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what happens <laughs> if Benoit doesn't pull. But anyway, it, it didn't make a difference. They go through the last corner. MVDP pretty much drops Benoit through the last corner with 300 meters to go, and Benoit has to sprint to his wheel. MVDP nearly crashes into the barriers in that corner. He sees Benoit's off the wheel through the corner. This is a lot like Marcus Hulgaard seeing he had, I don't recall who, maybe Lefay off his wheel in the center of Arctic race stage one, you'll recall, and MVDP opens it up. Just Benoit can't even get into his draft and has to sit up and applaud um, Great sportsmanship from him. Hate to see it. Lovely win from MVDP and an extremely exciting finish to Dwar's Door, which I think Flanders Classics, the race organizer, will be very, very happy with both the winner and how this finale played out. And the sprint behind, Pidcock beat Campanats. Campanats, a uh, great sprint, but let it out from the corner with 300 meters to go. So that's never going to work. Pole at fifth, Kung sixth, Kelly O'Brien, a lovely seventh, Turner, then Tranik, P Pagacha, Madawaz, 11th. Great race, Menji. Is there yeah. has anyone won DDV and RVV? Uh, I actually don't know. I would expect that Vanderpool won it. Did he do it in the year that he won RVV as well? I'm actually not certain about it. Nope, it was the year before. I don't know. I don't think so. What is the Vlaanderen? Let's take a look at their uh, results history so far, and then we <laughs> see Van, Van Barle, Vanderpool, Vanderpool, Lampard, De Buschere, well, I's na 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 na. I don't see it. I don't see it, to be honest. I think it's a curse. Is he, is he going to break the curse? I think it's a different race. It's two hours less racing, less climbing. Yeah. And, like, I don't think he'll... I don't think we'll see a group that we have here over the Paterberg and the Oude Quartermond and so forth that then give a uh, interesting last two kilometers. It will likely be the actual favourites, I would expect, or people that were sent in front of the climbs and so forth. So... I don't know. This is a different race. I wouldn't rate Dwarves of London as much as RVV, to be honest. And uh, I've got a feeling that while this was a good race, the last 30 kilometers, the piece before that wasn't too amazing either. So no. I don't know. I enjoyed the race. I can say that. That's for certain. And it shows that Campanaz was right when he said that this race fit him a lot because it's probably one of his better results next to Omlope Top 5 uh, in couple races uh, this season. And it's points for the team, which I think they will have, be happy with. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, this finale was more exciting than RVV the last two years, in my view. But that's just huh. <laughs> the finale, no. at least. But the start, not. Um, I'm trying to think of other storylines. Tish Benoit. I think we saw the template here, though, Benji. Like, imagine Laporte is here too, and Wout Van Aert in this finale. I think MVDP has a big, big problem, uh, a much bigger yep. problem. So. Even 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 today, like maybe he doesn't bridge back to Benoit. He did, but it's he can't close down all three of them and still win if Yumbo play their cards right on Sunday. Yeah, but I also think that the parkour does a lot because today's True. parkour was not hard enough for Van exactly. to make the difference on the climbs alone. And on RVV, that is the case. When it comes to Tish Benoit, it does show that he's very strong this year and he's definitely the third rider on Jumbo Visma I dare to say and it's solely because Laporte has that extra sprint and has already shown that he's also that a little bit better I'd argue that than Benoit this year but the thing is if you put Laporte with Van der Poel here I think it's a very close finish like when it comes to their sprint it's gonna be a close one what do you think who wins uh yeah, it depends on positioning I think they can both beat each other it depends who what's happened before and what yeah. how the sprint plays out. But I think Laporte can beat MVP in sprints. Um, ben Turner looks fantastic for Ineos. He's not on the provisional start list for RVV. I think that's incredibly surprising. Um, 
they're not exactly like full to the brim in their classic squad. So Mm -hmm. maybe they'll add him as a late addition. I think Benji suggested that. But yeah, DDV, great tune-up, lovely midweek race, and MVP takes another win. So hopefully he's injury-free, pain-free, and we see a huge heavyweight battle on Sunday. As I said, make sure to check out our preview for that one. Tomorrow we go through all the team's favourites and strategies. In the women's Dwarves Du of Landre, which was more sprint focused. There really wasn't much in the parkour, particularly in the last 40 Ks yep. after the Hotond. There was just like some short climbs. The Birkenhau, Canaryberg, Nocteberg, Hotond, which are like 600 meters, 800 meters, 6%. They were very, very far from the finish. 120 K race. We only we had Van Vluten, no Voss, no SD works at all. We did have. Brand Hosking, Longa Borghini, Van Dyke, but no Balsamo on a course which, after her Gent win, she would win this race. Trust me. Ludwig and Chapman at FDJ and Bastian Lee, sprinter at UA. So it really was sprint focused, except for DSM and Movistar for Van Vleuten. And to be honest, the star of the today, Benji's got to be Brody Chapman. How long was she solo for? Yeah, at least like 40 kilometers, I dare to say, because I started watching the second she was in that front group. Georgia Baker and Sefov attacked a bit earlier than that, but Brody Chapman was the attack that lost it. And she went solo for a, a very long while. And at some point, uh, she got a companion, Florcha Makai, in the breakaway as well. And that duo kept up for quite a bit, but it wasn't until the whole start where the action in the peloton started hammering again with the likes of Van Vleuten trying to uh, put some action in the works. Chapman had been caught together with Florcia Makai already at that point. So on Vleuten was trying to get rid of people because there's nothing in the last 40 kilometers. Like you said, that's very extreme for Van Vleuten to be able to drop people. So it was not going to be easy knowing that the parkour is easier than last year. And yeah, that was not happening, was it? No, she she kept trying to accredit, but she had Van Dyke and Trek marking it, which is kind of surprising. They almost were going for brand in a sprint. It was weird, Benji. Like the team construction here and tactics, like ADV would have been in a much better position if she had Norsgaard here as a sprint backup option, and Trek would have been a lot better if they had uh, Balsamo here. I mean, there is Sierra here for Movistar. She's capable of. She's a good runner. She can sprint to a top five, maybe. But yeah, surprise. Anyway, it all came down to a sprint. We had Bastianelli here, Sierra, as I mentioned, Brand, um, Barbieri for Live Racing, Pfeiffer Georgie, Xavi, Julie DeVilda for Planta Pura. It was Bastianelli, the experienced ex world champ for UA Team ADQ, who opened it up from the last corner, 300 meters to go, maybe. And I think she would have won this race if she had either a lead out or just played it better. Um, she stuffed her sprint, went so early, let it out, and it was Chiara Consoni from Valcar, another young Italian, 22 years old, the same team that Bolzano was on last year, almost the same age as Bolzano was last year, who wins this race ahead of Julie de Vilda and Elise Xavi, which is a really good result for her and Canyon Schramm. Pfeiffer Georgie fourth and Bastianelli only being fifth. Barbieri Lynette was at Sierra and Swinkles rounding out the top 10. But a huge win for Consani Benji. She's third at Plouet last year. She's won some smaller races. I know this isn't a world tour race. Ah, oh, she's won Bulls Ladies Tour stage five um, ahead of Vibas actually <laughs> in 2019. So hugely talented. She's on Valcar next year, but I think she'll be going. She's going places. Yeah, I think so as well. I'd argue that she's one of the uh, perhaps top five sprinters right now, I dare to say. And we've seen that this season already. She's got so many close calls, second in Uting and second in Le Samet. We've got top tens on so many races. And then she was crashed out by Guarishi's uh, deviation in the Vuelta Valenciana Feminas uh, earlier this season, the first race of the season. So... Yeah, she's destined to win more sprints in the future. She's only 22, and uh, I expect a lot from that. And the thing is, like, one more year, she'll be 23. That's a perfect moment to have your contract running out because then uh, you can cash in, most likely. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, will she get a trek? Because they she's Italian, but they have Belzema yeah. there. So 
I kind of think Movistar or somebody like that actually need a, a pure bunch sprinter. I'm not sure Norsgaard is that pure bunch sprinter like a Consani, but she's still developing too. But UAE replace Bastianelli? Yeah, that's the one. That's the obvious. You're right. That's that's got to be it, right? With Bastianelli's, I think. And last year of her contract this year, she's 34. Even if she runs for another three, four years, which she's more than capable of doing, she's flying this year still. It'd be good to have a backup with Consani um, coming through. Yeah, that's a good call. Uh, but otherwise, looking forward to RVV this weekend, where unlike the men's DDV, we will see the return of a stacked SD Works with Kopecky and Co. Make sure to check out, as I said, our preview for that men and women dropping tomorrow but otherwise enjoyable ddv and midweek racing thanks to swift as always for their support of the podcast and we'll see you sunday ciao